Millennials, the most open-minded, diverse, and woke generation yet, but they're the lowest population in the church. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. What is causing our young people to turn away from the church? The missing millennials. Hello. Welcome to the Big E, the elephant in the room. My name is Melissa. And I'm Jackie. And we today will be talking about the missing millennials. We have some wonderful guests on our panel today. We have Miss Alicia, and we also have Dr. Stacy Wallen. And we will be talking about the missing millennials. So let's just get started and jump right into this conversation. When it comes to the missing millennials, we have noticed that the church has grown very slim to the younger generation in the church. And we thought it would be a great piece to just to discuss why is this happening and what ways we can move forward to bring more young people back into the church. So let's just get started um, with uh, Dr. Wallen. Can you explain or just tell a little bit about yourself and then also what have you been noticing over the years with the missing millennials in the church? Okay, well, thank you ladies for having me. Um, I um, am currently a professor of communication sciences and disorders in Atlanta at Georgia State University, where I am now teaching lots of, uh, well, not millennials, but uh, Generation Y and Zers. Uh, and what I'm finding is, um, I feel like this generation is definitely thinking about religion a little bit differently. Um, and I don't know if that's because their parents may have raised them differently than they were raised, but they, they're more accepting of differences as a whole. Um, and they look at those differences as just that. It's not, you know, well, we need to convert and have everybody believe the same thing that we believe. They believe that everyone has a right to their own belief and they respect it. So part of me feels like that could be a part of the reason why we're not seeing um, as many um as many young people in the church because they believe that, you know, they can access God anywhere, not necessarily in a church building. So now that's not to say that there aren't a whole lot of, um, you know, millennials and younger generations that are actually like really about the business of the church. It just means that they're doing it a little bit differently than we remember. So, um, Ms. Alicia, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and tell, give us a feedback of what you have noticed over the years um, with the missing millennials in our church? Hi, uh, my name is Alicia. I'm currently living outside of the U.S. I'm in the education field. I'm a teacher and administrator. Um, and what I've noticed is that millennials are not really looked at as who they are. So they're not really um we we're not really acknowledging all of the aspects of millennials and that reason why that they may not be in the church so when we look at like uh research that has gone into uh employers employers are doing research because they they know that they want to employ these millennials right and so they've done and they found out things about them that like the church is not really acknowledging for example um they found that more millennials, they're looking for materialistic rewards, right? They're looking for, um, as Stacy Stacy said, that they they're not really um, they're really open, right? Accepting, they're kind of, they question more than our generation and generations before them did. They they have a lot of questions. They're open, but their questions are like. Not like our questions. When we were growing up, we might question biblical theology, right? But they're, they're even questioning the validity or the need for the church, for the church as we know it, the, the, the building, right? 
And so they are looking and we can use it. We look, we are, and another thing is that we're looking at a lot of the differences with the millennials as all negative instead of tapping into the differences and using them as a positive as a lot of the prospective employers are. So I'm wondering if that has anything to do with a lot of parents that were born in the 30s, 1930s, since slavery was a little bit closer to that as opposed to slavery is kind of like far away, although there are different forms of slavery, but we're talking about the one that we know about. And I'm wondering if that has a lot to do with how parents raised their children back then as opposed to how it is now. Your thoughts? It's interesting you say that because um, one of the other findings was that millennials are now more heavily influenced by trends, the trends that they're experiencing and the trends that their parents experience um, because they're more exposed to internet and information, right? They're more in touch with now we, we, there's so many ads for therapy and meditation and your chakras have to be aligned and all these things that you see the millennials are involved in. So they're more more in touch with it and they're looking at like, so you look at their parents, as Jacqueline said, their parents are going through divorce. A lot of their parents have gone through divorce. And so that is affecting them and they're saying, marriage, maybe it's not that important, you know, or I'm going to wait or, you know, they just don't believe in it. So those things are, they are more heavily affected directly by these trends and they're changed and they change a lot. They're used to changes, rapid changes in technology. So they're not going to just sit back and be like, oh, we've been doing this. We're fine with continuing to do it the same way, the same way, the same way. No. So there must be a high level of freedom these days compared to how it was back then. I think about I think about my parents' generation, right? So everything about what life was for them is like completely different from what it is now. You know what I mean? The church was their social outlet. The church was their um, education outlet. The church was everything. The church was their community. And I think that, you know, our generation, we had a little bit of both. You know, the church was our community, but then we started to branch out and experience different things. You know, we may have um, interacted with people who didn't look like us, who went to school who, with people who didn't worship like us. And our parents encouraged that, you know, at least most of our parents encouraged that because they understood the importance of knowing about your world. Now our kids, oh my goodness, my kids are so tolerant of everything. They're like, yeah, so what are, what are this person's pronouns? What, you know, so-and-so believes this. Well, you have to remember, we've got to worry about, we've got to make sure that we don't do it during Ramadan. I mean, they're thinking about all of these things that we never had to think about because they are exposed to more. And I feel like the church should be recognizing that, but part of me feels like the church was created to help keep people of like mind together instead of, um, people of like mind slash spirit kind of going out and finding other people who may think like you in one aspect, but not another. Um, so I, I definitely feel like society and just overall the, um, the way history has changed and the way events have kind of rolled out has changed how people think about the church and how people view the church. So has that change been a positive one for the church and the millennials? Is that why they're missing? It, it depends on who you talk. It, it could be a more positive thing. I feel like if people would embrace change, but people don't like change, you know, change is hard. So I feel like we all kind of think about and try to reminisce about the good old days, right? Oh, your music's not like my music. My generation is better than your generation. And I feel like people like to cling to what's comfortable and what's familiar. And I, I think that the church has fallen into that instead of embracing um, what could be because of our interpretation of what it always was. So let me ask you, um, young lady, uh, what is your perspective? I'm thinking the older generation was a lot more strict 
more structured. Um, it was either this is just the way we're in line and how we were also raised, it was more of a more structure. Do you think that is causing, because now as the younger parents as we are, we were raised a certain way. Now we're giving a lot more leniency to our children to be more open-minded. Do you think we might be some of the piece of the puzzle that's drawing our children away from the church? I think that definitely has a part to do with it. But I think that um, I think that parents may underestimate the influence that they don't have, right? The influences that are coming from outside. You know, a lot of parents are saying they're lenient, but I feel like a lot of times it's because they they're feeling the pressure from outside, right? If they're if they're like, okay, you, you're going to church. I mean, when we were growing up, we would go to church. Um, we knew we had to go to church, but our parents also knew that we had other young people in church, right? There were Sabbath school classes. There were AY programs. There were like, you know, um, avenues and, 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 and a network for us. But now if, if we're like, okay, you have to go to church, but you know that there really, there's no programs for the young people that's kind of going to influence, you know, I think that also, um, as Stacey was saying earlier, like they're going, they're getting so much information that they are getting this, they're teaching, they're showing us like, oh, they, they, them, they, them, oh, he, she, like, you know, just with the pronouns, that's like so poignant because you're seeing it. So they're bringing it to us and they're, we we can't, even if we wanted to be strict, there's only but so much we can kind of like shelter them from. So do you think on the back end of that same question I was just talking about, do you think when the millennials start coming in to the church and they see this, our former, you know, former generation, how they're a little bit more strict, do you think that they're even looking at the model of how their spiritual life is? And if they don't see that consistency and foundation, they're thinking, well, why do I need to go to church? Because they're not doing it. So why should I go? I know from the millennials I've come in cost, they don't really care about anything. There is no fear. There is no major care. They're going to do them. Uh, the age of technology and the age of information, as already everyone's had mentioned, Lacey and Dr. Stacy. There's choices, their choices. And the parents that are closer to the millennials, they're more a little bit more lenient with things. So as you can see the trend, you see strictness, you really see having no choice. Back in the 30s, there was no choice. Back 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there was a little bit more freedom right in that era. And then as we get closer to the millennial age, then there, there is a reason, whatever is relative, so to speak. So I think we have a trend where it's piggybacking off of us as parents or as adults, even if not a parent, but the adults that are in that era before the millennials and now we're in this generation. So that's just my thoughts on that. But ladies, share yours. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think that every generation plays a part in what you see now. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't. OK, this is this is, I guess, an analogy that I that I tend to use sometimes because you, you're not just seeing it in the church. You're not just seeing these patterns in the church. You're seeing it across society in the workplace. You know, if I'm working with people who are there, some who may be a little bit like my parents age then some, you know, a lot of baby boomers and the baby boomers see things very concrete black, white, this is what it is, this is what you do. Your parents say to do this, or if your boss tells you to do this, or someone older tells you to do it, you do it. You know, then they're, you know, my generation, Generation X, we're in there and we're like, yeah, I get it. But, you know, part of me is like, well, why don't we try it differently? Then we have people that are like right below me who are like, Psh fuck the system. Let's do whatever, whatever. And we're all trying to be in this boat together. And it is like, 
catastrophic. You know what I mean? I think about if we think about just the different tastes, the different tastes of music, the different ways that people want to worship, you see such stark differences. So there, it may be that instead of trying to argue or buck the system, these young people are like, you know what? I'm just not even going to bother with it because this is the way they want it to be in the church. So let me just let them have that. And then I'll do me. Like, like Jack was saying, I'll do me and I'll, I'll be good because I believe that God is everywhere. I don't necessarily have to be in this church. Now, I will say as a parent of a, I guess technically they're Zers, they're Generation Z, Zoomers, whatever they call them now. Um, I have struggled with the fact that I wasn't as consistent with, you know, the weekly going to church and all of that as my kids got older. When they were younger, I was like, you know what, this is a really good foundation. But I also think that sometimes our generation and, you know, um, maybe even generation of the millennials kind of struggle with their walk, you know, and like, do I want to if I'm not sure, or if I sometimes waver, do I want to be that kind of example for my for my child, or do I want them to, you know, just come to this experience on their own? And I think that part of that is how we think about raising children. So our parents were that generation of do as I say, not as I do. Whereas I feel like our generation, Generation X, is like, yeah. I need to model what I want you to do. So if I'm not doing it, why should I ask you to do it? So I I think that you'll always find some differences um, just in general, some outliers. But I do think that part of it is, you know, each generation's probably struggle or not struggle with their walk, with what they were raised to believe. Do they really still believe it? If they do still believe it, how can they apply it to their lives now? I like the analogy that you used about the boat. Um, so I'm thinking like when you said the boat, I'm like, maybe we could uh, suggest something about the missing millennials as a cruise ship boat. Because, it, you know, when you go on a cruise ship, there are different areas for different tastes. Yeah. <laughs> and we can all yeah. be in the same boat. <laughs> Just go ahead and go to this that please with you. <laughs> all the old heads on the Lido deck. All the old heads on the Lido deck. <laughs> but I, I, you know what? I feel like at some point they're trying that, but there's still this struggle again for control. Yeah. But, and, and that's the thing I was going to say. I realized that churches, despite denomination, they, they have a structure. Mm-hmm. And it's a structure on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And this is no, you know, no offense to any of that because you still need st- structure and no, not like you said, in the workplace, in the church, but as they're seeing their church well dwindling down in denomination and they're seeing where that lack is, they're, they have to see where they have to make a shift because that's just part of, as you think about it in the uh, the way they worship in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, it's not the same way they worship in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and uh, all the way into now. So is it the fact that the church is not willing to shift or there, or it's just maybe some of the members that are saying, okay, this is the way it's going to be. Either they take it or leave it. Or like how, what can possibly the church do as a whole to develop more of an attraction to start luring this generation back into the church? Because there's accountability in all of this. Mm -hmm. There is truly accountability. So what needs to happen in this process? The church is not willing to look at reality. That's just, I mean, I can go into a whole, that's a whole nother conversation, I think. But at least Miss Alicia was about to say something. So I don't want to. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think that it's this um, moving away from community. Um, The millennials and even with us uh, as, again, 
Dr. Stacy was saying, that like even when like if our generation would be like, uh, you know, we're kind of wavering with our our children, you know, taking them being consistent on a week to week basis and so forth. Um, for our parents' generation and their the generation before them, then auntie would be coming by, grandma would be coming by and taking them. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so as we are going throughout the generations, we're seeing a less less of community. And then you couple that with the millennials having the viewpoint of what's in it for me. You know, what's in it for me? I remember you know, watching this uh, program about why there was a lack of, of men, why the, the male population was decreasing. And it, it just kind of spoke, and not to get too much into it, but it just kind of spoke to um, men needing, meaning to, they have to be needed. They want to be needed. They have to have a purpose, right? And a lot of the things, the singing and a lot of the, the emotional part of it, they don't really have a purpose. So if, if you put men to work, they'll stay in the church. And so I think that that kind of speaks to the millennials as well. What's in it for me? If you look at their, and you say, well, millennials are social, like, they have social media. But a lot of the drive for social media is what's in it for me? Who's going to like my picture? Who's going to feed my right. ego? Who's going to follow me? Who's going to connect me? Who's going to buy my Product. my beads? Who's going to buy my whatever, you know? So we need to, to, to build more community and to really make it like tap into what they need um, and putting them in place because a lot of the, another issue that the church has is that the generations we're holding on and we have to let go. Then you have the millennials who are being shunned for, and they're being shamed for who they are. So there's a lot of them. There's like, there's no room. There's no place for them. Right. So what drives the millennials away from the beginning? I like that. I like what you said, Alicia, about um, community, right? It's like um, everybody wants to belong. And I think that that sense of community is what brought people to the church because they're like, okay, I feel like I belong. But I think that our, our community is larger now than it was back then, you know, because now we, our community is the world. Um, and I know we know that there are other denominations, other religions that are going through this. But what I, I will say that my husband, who was born and raised in the Christian church, is now Buddhist, right? So looking at his organization, the way they have set it up in some ways are similar to the old ways of the church being set up, but it's also different. Because they, I think, are focusing on what Alicia talked about in terms of community. So he is what they call the SGI, I call him the Tina Turner, Lewis, right? SGI. They are a grassroots kind of lay persons organization. So when they go to their services, they, before COVID, they used to do services in people's homes and they would find and assign you to a community that is close to where you live so that the barriers are down, right? And then they've got people who stay in contact with you. Their young people's ministry, they accept every and anything. They don't care who, what, where, how you are. They are accepting of you. They are pulling in things that they see Um, that the young people like, and they are utilizing it in their practice. And when I look, when I would, you know, sometimes I go to the services, well, pre-COVID, and when I go, such a wide range of people, ages, everything. Now, some of their issues are the same issues that we have. They're like, how do we continue to keep keep our, um, our membership strong? But they are doing things to attract, if they know that there's gonna be a march with Black Lives Matter, guess what? Everybody's gonna be there. If they know that these young people are artists or musicians, um, then they're creating some kind of outlet for them to do their work in the organization. Um, And I feel like 
for other organizations is more of let's let's figure out how to make our members conform to us instead of us trying to see how we can embrace them. Yeah. And I think that that is probably one of the main reasons. The church is built on conformity. All right, you come in and then you do what we tell you, you do like we do. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. That's exactly what I was going to say when I was making the point earlier about reality. The church is not realistic. They are dogmatic, uh, very judgmental, and condemning. There, there is no God as love. That's that's a that's a deceptive statement. That's because people. That's because people are charged, and people are petty. You know what I mean? People are petty. If they. You know, if we were living the life that Christ lived, it wouldn't look like this. You no. know, it really wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. At all. At all. No. What would you t- tell their, them directly to bring in the millennials, bring in members that can bring more of that open-minded uh, and willingness to, to fully love and not and not be so judgmental and be so strict and just and and so harsh in their way of of just um, managing their their worship service. I think what I would probably first do is you know encourage the the church leadership to change their mindset. Now we can try and do that, but you know the reality is. Mm-hmm. Every organization has a power structure, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you want to make change, you got to have somebody in power, right? So we need to figure out how to get people in power who can see this or create a whole new system, right? Create a new system, create a new, I mean, I, I don't want to say create a new religion, but create a new structure that embraces people where they are and embraces them for who they are so that they can live their best life and help others live their best life. Because I mean, everything is really about how do we live the life of Christ and live or whatever um, you know higher power you ascribe to. How do we live more like that? And the reality is in order, living like that means that we treat other people like we would want ourselves to be treated. So I think that getting back to the foundation of what is the purpose of this religion or what is the purpose of this organization? And if it is to show God's love, then shoot. We need to just go out there in the community and figure out ways to show this love. Ask questions instead of dictate. I mean, you'd be surprised what you find out when you ask a question. Open-ended you know? questions. <laughs> Open-ended, <laughs> not directive questions like this, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think that, you know, finding out, we're speaking about millennials, like finding out what is it that they want and listening and following through. If we do that and we ask questions, I think that that will be a step towards uh, keeping the millennials and uh, attracting them. It's definitely um, some great insight to provide to the millennials and just um, hoping that the millennials will, uh, we can uh, bring some great insight to them and also to the churches as a whole. Um, because it is definitely a need, um, is also a big void in the church, and um, we, we can be an inspiration and, and uh, help and give a good resource to someone that uh, really is looking for that piece of the puzzle that is missing in their life and their spiritual walk, because everyone definitely has a purpose, and we don't want anyone to ever doubt that they don't have a purpose by someone giving them a negative feedback, um, like we're saying in the older generation or, or discouraging them. So we want millennials always to move forward. We want millennials to strive. We want them to continue to grow and use all the talents and the gifts that God has definitely given them. So ladies, we just want to thank you again 
And thank you for watching The Big E, The Elephant in the Room, where we speak about the unspeakable. is Demita Joe. Each Wednesday, you can find me here at 3 p.m. I'll be over here discussing different things that are going on and try to bring you a boost of positivity for your week because we all need this. We're going to share some feel-good stories. We might find a hometown hero. We may take a look at some trending topics and sometimes we might even find a lesson in a not so warm and fuzzy story if we can. I'm Demita Joe, and I'll see you guys on the next episode right here on What's Going On? with your weekly RATV news break. Each Thursday at 12 noon Eastern, we'll come to you with the latest news, trends, and more with a positive spin. We know there's a lot of positive news that doesn't get reported, but we want to give you the opportunity to share your story here on RATV. If you have a positive news story you want us to share, you can submit your story to news at re-tv.net. Don't forget to subscribe to the Relationship Entertainment Television YouTube channel. Download the new RATV Live app on your mobile device and follow Relationship Entertainment Television on your favorite social media platform. Don't forget, make sure you tune in to the RATV News Break each Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Until, Until then, then, be blessed and be great. Hey, it's your girl Tia Robertson. I'm the host of Entrepreneur Insider. <music> Eastern for entrepreneurs and news that you need to know about. See you there. Growing up in the church, we saw a lot. Things that people refused to talk about. The elephants in the room. Mental illness. Sexual abuse. Broken family. Domestic violence. And so much more. The Big E, The Elephant in the Room is a show that sheds light on these topics. We're here to speak about the unspeakable.